All right, guys, so welcome to our workshop. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is William Ortiz. I'm the instruction librarian, and I'll let the other presenters introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Brent Singleton. I am the coordinator for reference services. And I'm Eric Malikevich. I'm the university archivist here in Special Collections of the Fowl Library. All right, thank you. So the way this will work is I'll present, then Eric, then Brent, and then we'll take questions at the end. So let me go ahead and get started with my part. Um, so what I'll be talking about is critical information literacy. Um, I'm going to give sort of an overview snapshot on what it is, why it's important, how does it work, and how to use it in your curriculum. Um, just as an aside, I'm currently battling a really bad cold, so I'll try to get through this as um, coherently and concisely as possible. Okay, so um, again, my name is William Ortiz. I'm the instruction librarian. And today we're going to talk about, in my portion of the presentation, what is critical information literacy? How is it different and unique from information literacy? Why does it matter to us and our students? And then I'll point you to a bunch of really good resources you can take advantage of right now as faculty. So here's a little um, textbook definition of it. So critical information literacy um, is, sort of looks at the socio-political dimensions of information and looks at the systems of power that shape the creation, distribution, and reception of that information. So the way I like to think of it is sort of looking at the information landscape, you know, what makes one, you know, this information more valuable than this information? What allows me to access this information and doesn't allow me to access this information? What structures of power exist to allow for that access or to act as a barrier? Okay, and so let's talk a little bit about um, theory. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, I love talking about theory. So uh, critical pedagogy. Critical information literacy kind of comes from uh, critical pedagogy, which was termed, um, kind of founded, or not founded, but uh, made popular by uh, Paulo Freire in his landmark work, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And what that does is it sort of gives a critique of banking education. So kind of going against this sort of, I give you facts. I give the students facts for them to take in and store, right? It calls for active learning. It calls for sort of um, getting rid of this hierarchy of the teacher up here on the soapbox and the student down here and calls for us to kind of come together on the same level for us to be co-learners um, and more facilitators with our students. Um, so culturally responsive, um, critical information literacy is inherently very social justice oriented because it talks a lot about, um, you know, the power structures that sort of make it inequitable, that make access to information inequitable. So that in itself is sort of culturally responsive because a lot of um, critical information literacy lesson plans revolve around um, sort of topics, ideas, uh, cultures that have been historically marginalized. So I've seen a lot of really good lesson plans, for example, one of them, um, and I'll show you all where to find these lesson plans um, afterwards. Uh, one of them calls for sort of looking at hip hop songs as primary resources to, um, you know, uh, events that they're covering or events they're about. Um, a lot of them look at sort of, um, major events in the news, sort of like the crisis at the border or a couple years ago, the George Floyd murders, looking at the information cycle of, um, you know, from news to, to history. So a lot of things like that. So really um, are responsive to our students' culture. And then um, this critical information literacy lends itself well to a high impact practice, uh, specifically the service learning and community-based learning, because it really encourages students to go out there into the world and ask a question that's relevant to them and their lives. Um, so you can see this quote from Ellenberg, um, who's considered one of the grandfathers of critical information literacy. Um, it empowers students to um, uh, ask questions, ask and answer questions that matter to them and the world around them. So, how is it different than traditional information literacy? So I talked a little bit about this before, but information literacy is very procedural. It's sort of a set of skills. 
For example, how do I locate this information? What tools do I use to find this information? How do I evaluate if this information you know, serves my purpose? How do I use this information? For example, in terms of citation, how do I um, you know, communicate in scholarly fashion? So those are very sort of procedural skills. Um, but critical information literacy goes a little bit above that and it looks at why do I need those skills in the first place? What systems exist for me to need to learn these skills to interact with the scholarly world? So um, what's the process that goes into the creation of information? You know, how did this information, rather than just citing this information, let me ask, how was this information created? Um, how is authority constructed? Who has authority? We look at, you know, um, why does one source have authority over the other? Do I have authority in certain things? And then we look at um, something really interesting, the creator's social location or point of view in the information source. So, you know, we try to be as instructors and as librarians, we try to be as neutral as we can, but nothing is completely unbiased, right? We go through life experiences and that informs how we intake information and how we uh, produce information, you know, whether we want it to or not. That's inherently as part um, part of us in the education process. So this kind of also goes back to critical pedagogy. Um, part of that calls for us to not reject that, but sort of to embrace that and to put that into the forefront. So our identity as um, individuals. So for example, I'm a Hispanic first generation male, and that has influenced how I've taken in information and that influences how I produce information. So it's good to sort of be aware of all that, you know, not just information, but what creates all that information. So more examples, um, information literacy, when would I do, use JSTOR or when would I use Wikipedia? You know, they both have their uses, but knowing, you know, which one along the information or the research process, which one, where do they fit in that process? And again, databases, you know, information literacy tells me, okay, which database should I use? If I'm writing an education paper, maybe I should um, look at ERIC. And then another big part of information literacy is how to search. So Boolean operators, how do I construct a um, effective search when I'm looking for these databases? So that's information literacy. But when we get into critical information literacy, we start to look at the value of information, you know, why is this information valued over other information? Why is this journal more prestigious than other journals? Um, and then talking about open access, you know, the social justice component of open access is to try to get information to be open and free. But is it really free? Does open access really solve everything? Or is that just another piece of the puzzle? Um, you know, a quote here, um, information wants to be free, but a lot of it isn't. There's a lot of barriers um, explicit and implicit barriers to a lot of information. So why does all this matter to our students? <clears throat> I think it's important for us to uh, remember or to keep in mind who we are um, as an institution, um, who we serve, um, and who we are as individuals. So we are a Hispanic serving institution. Our students are approximately 70% 70, 70 Hispanic students and a large percent of that are first generation students. So that's, um, you know, a specific kind of uh, learning community that we serve. Um, and then we have to ask what's important or relevant to our students, you know. In the literature, um, historically, first generation students don't really see themselves in the institution. They don't see their culture. They don't feel um, a sense of belonging. Um, and this kind of ties back to our strategic planning, you know, um, go 1.1 is to sort of foster that sense of belonging. So it's important, critical information literacy is important to us and to our students because it really covers a lot of this. It really brings their identity to the forefront. Um, it lets students ask why, you know. Um, a lot of students feel like they don't see themselves in higher education. They don't see themselves represented. And I recently gave um, a tour to a group of Project Rebound students and I asked them, you know, what are the barriers to, to the library? And they say it's just, it's overwhelming. They don't know where to begin. You know, it's this big foreign thing um, that they never really um, had any prior information, you know, in their lives and their um, K through 12 education, you know, nothing really taught them the skills or, you know, how to integrate or how to use um, this institution of higher learning. So there's that. It lets students ask why. 
why didn't I ever learn growing up this information? You know, what sort of what barriers were there that kept this information from me? So it empowers students to really it brings this to the forefront and lets them ask, you know, why is there this disparity? And um, so here are a couple of prompts and I'll show you um, this came from our on our library webpage. We have this page called the Critical Information Literacy Lab, and we have a lot of good resources. So I'll go over that in a little bit. But here are a couple of prompts. So student um, SLO, student learning outcome, free versus fee based information. So some prompts you can ask. What are the pros and cons of charging for information on the deep web? Um, you know, what are different types of resources you'll find on the open web versus the deep web? And then um, for this one, popular versus scholarly resources. When might be it, when is it a good idea to use popular rather than scholarly resource? And then um, what does it mean to be an author? Who is an author in your community, um, in your family? Um, in which areas are you an authority? So really um, good conversations, good prompts to to get them started to thinking about that. And so for the rest of these five minutes that I have, I want to go over. Um, a lot of good resources that um, that could be useful to you. So uh, CIL prompts and best practices. Um, so let me go back here. So um, this is the web page that I was talking about. Um, we have five learning outcomes for critical information literacy, and each one has its own page of discussion prompts and class activities that you can take and modify to use in your classes. So for example, these are good discussion prompts to have. Um, what are some, you know, the ones that I, I went over already? Um, here are some class activities. You know, they use, um, they present you with an article and give you a prompt uh, and directions for your students to use. Um, if we want to go look at popular versus scholarly resources, we have a set of discussion prompts um, William, for them. William, the websites aren't displaying. Oh. It's just showing your PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let me. Um, Stop sharing and let me try to share that. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so let me go back to that. Um, so again, this is the first uh, learning outcome, discussion prompts, class activities. Um, so here are a bunch of uh, resources you can look at and then going to popular and scholarly resources. So more discussion prompts, um, and more class activities. Um, so these are good good resources for you to use. Um, let's see, the other cool thing we have here are other um, lesson plan ideas from other faculty. So we have a collection of lesson plans that incorporate critical information literacy. So here's one for Music um, 1800. So we have our critical uh, information literacy learning outcomes and then a uh, definition of the assignment. Um, we have them in different disciplines, CAL, admin, communications. Let's look at this one. Um, so all of these are here for you to use. And I'll go ahead and make sure you guys all have access to this at the end of our presentation. Um, so this is a, a good resource. The other thing I want to point out um, is the Library Ambassador Program. So. Um, what that is, is I train peer mentors to become sort of experts in the library and have them go out to present to first year classes. So they go over basic resources of the library, but I also encourage them to, um, to talk about their own experience with the library and their own resource, uh, research experience with the library. So students can kind of get, you know, a different take on it. Like we as faculty can um, tell them, um, you know, how, great research is or our experience in research, but it kind of has a different effect if they hear it from their their peers. So this goes back to sort of uh, critical information literacy and challenging that hierarchical um, component of the faculty up here and the student down here. And it really brings, you know, it lets the student take charge of their um, their learning by hearing from from their peers. Um, and one last thing. Um, we will be hosting an inclusive citation workshop. So inclusive citation is a part of critical information literacy. Um, I've heard faculty talk about, you know, looking at my bibliography and my course materials. A lot of this material comes from, you know, white male authors. 
So this workshop will look at how to sort of diversify our, our bibliography, our, our course materials, and how to do it in a way that, you know, lets us um, shine a light on our diverse scholars in our different disciplines. So we'll be having that workshop in fall, so look out for that. And then um, lastly, I kind of wanted to go over um, in the minute or two that I have left, um, a sample lesson that I created, and I can make this available to you um, at the end if you would like it. So I was looking at um, Wikipedia Access, uh, critical, a critical information literacy look at Wikipedia. So we talk about you know things being on Wikipedia, that it's a free platform, that it's all um, you know anyone with internet can access it, but can they access it? So here are a couple learning outcomes that I talk about. Um, so define critical information literacy, and then the uh, the factors that perceive a, that shape authority and marginalize different groups. So the main point of this lesson was um, looking at global internet access. Like we say, it's free on the internet, but who really has internet access? And what kind of internet access do they have? And then in terms of Wikipedia, who publishes that? So whose voices are heard and whose voices aren't heard? So majority of, of edits come from you know, the United States and Europe, but then what about the rest of the world? And um, most of the content on Wikipedia is in English. So what does that say about, you know, access for other, um, you know, other countries that speak other languages? So um, this is a, a lesson plan that um, I created, and I'd be happy to share with you and help you um, modify it uh, depending on your, um, your needs. And that about wraps up my section. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Eric. All right, let me just share my screen. Um, all right, are the slides showing okay, everyone? They're up, cool. All right, so yeah, so good afternoon, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Milikevich and I'm the University Archivist here at CSUSB. Uh, today I'm going to cover um, a few examples of how archival resources can be integrated into student projects. And for each of these examples, I'm going to detail the student objectives, the structure of an in-person uh, class visit to special collections in university archives, and the final assignment that students will complete. Um, there are many other project possibilities uh, beyond what I'll present here today uh, that can support a variety of different uh, disciplines and student learning outcomes. The examples I'll share are gonna focus in on history and art and design, um, but projects can be developed to support courses in um, pretty much any field. So English, communication studies, and others. So if this presentation sparks an idea that you have for a student project, um, definitely feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss what some of the possibilities are. Uh, before getting started here today though, I do wanna take a quick moment to acknowledge the teacharchives.org website. This is a really great resource that provides educators and archivists uh, with guidance on archives-based learning, which is designed to bring students who are unfamiliar with primary source research out of the classroom and into the archives. Uh, all of the example projects that I'll be discussing today were modeled after the exercises presented on the teacharchives.org website, uh, and then localized to leverage the specific archival resources that are available to faculty and students here at CSUSB through our special collections. So our first example today uh, is designed for an undergraduate history course, uh, and it will have students examine historical maps and guidebooks, um, all which are available in special collections, to learn more about points of interest in California during the 20th century. For this project, students will locate pertinent historical information about a point of interest in California using the maps and guidebooks and compile information gathered from archival research to craft a short descriptive entry on a California point of interest. This project requires one one hour visit to special collections where students will meet with the archivist and also view the materials. The archivist will provide students with a brief five minute introduction to special collections, explaining why these materials are here and why they cannot be checked out like other library materials. The archivist is all, will also explain the general guidelines for accessing, handling, and using archival materials on site in the special collections reading room. Uh, after this, students will then move on to independent research for 40 minutes where they will get hands on time with the archival resources. Students will look through the various maps and guidebooks select a point of interest to learn more about, and then gather information and compile notes for the descriptive entry they will be asked to write. 
The students are provided with a few prompts here uh, just to get them started. So things like, what is your point of, where is your point of interest located? Describe this area the best you can. Who is the primary audience for this point of interest? Is it adults? Is it children, tourists, another group? And is there an entrance fee or is it free uh, to enter? Students will also be asked to take a photo of the map or guidebook they select for use in their final assignment. Uh, during the last 15 minutes of this visit, the professor and archivist will lead students uh, in a brief discussion where they will reflect on their experience handling original materials and also describe what they learned from them. For the final assignment, students will use the notes they took during their visit to write a 250 to 300 word narrative description of the point of interest. This will be written for the web and published as a blog style post to the course website, accompanied by the photo of the map or guidebook taken by the student during their class visit. This next example, it's also developed for an undergraduate history course. Uh, here, students are given access to multiple primary source items about San Bernardino to better understand a, a specific aspect of San Bernardino history. So the students will closely inspect and analyze the primary source items about San Bernardino, post questions of the primary source and locate answers in a secondary source, and then demonstrate working knowledge of a specific aspect of San Bernardino history. There will be two class visits to special collections for this project lasting about 45 minutes each. Uh, on the first visit, the archivist will again provide a brief introduction to special collections, just like what they did in the first example. And this will last uh, about the same, about five minutes. This will be followed uh, by a 10 minute group walkthrough where the archivist will introduce students to a variety of primary sources about San Bernardino, including things such as promotional publications, event programs, annual reports, and other items. The archivist will help student understand the different formats, what information each source can provide, and how to use each type of item. Students will then be given 30 minutes of independent research time to examine the items, select one they will focus on for their assignment, and then begin analyzing it based on the guidance from their professor. During the week between the first and the second visit to special collections, students will conduct additional uh, background research about a subject related to the primary source item they chose using secondary sources. On the second visit, students will be provided with a quick refresher on using special collections and will then continue to analyze their primary source, incorporating the additional research they conducted in between visits. The last 10 minutes of the second site visit will be allocated for wrap up, uh, where the students will share a brief description of their primary source item and an interesting observation about it, along with something they learned from their secondary source research that informs their understanding of the selected primary source. The final assignment for this project uh, is a three to four page research paper that integrates analysis of their chosen primary source with the outside research that they conducted. Uh, in our last example for today, uh, this one is going to be intended for undergraduate, for an undergraduate art and design course. So here students will examine photographic prints, tintypes and stereographs, uh, again, all available in special collections. Uh, to analyze the technological development and changing social meaning of photography over time. Students here will identify and distinguish various photographic formats that have been used over time and articulate a working knowledge of the technical and historical developments that have influenced photography and that will continue to change into the future. There will be one visit to special collections lasting about 50 minutes, again, beginning with an introduction to special collections by the archivist, However, this time that'll last about 10 minutes um, because there will be a brief discussion on how to properly handle photographic materials since there are some special handling requirements for these types of items. During the next 25 minutes, students will work in pairs to examine the three different photographic formats, including the prints, tintypes, and stereographs. As part of this process, students will also complete a handout where they will first, where they will first write a short description of each photograph as an artifact then they will describe the image that's depicted. And finally, they'll comment on how the physical process of making the photograph may have influenced the image and the photographer, how it may have influenced the image that the photographer was able to create. During the last 15 minutes, students will reconvene for an informal class discussion where they'll share their individual observations with the group. After the visit, students will write up a 200 to 300 word comparison of the photographic formats that they examined in person with the digital photograph that they've taken themselves that explores how the format changes the experience of both taking and viewing photographs. 
So now that I've covered some of the project examples, um, let's take a look at the archival resources available in our special collection of the university archives here at CSUSB that can be integrated into student projects. So here at CSUSB, we use the archive space platform to host our archival collection finding aids or guides um, that detail the collection's topical coverage, as well as the format types that it includes. Um, archive space can be accessed from the main special collections website. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. So here's the main special collections and archives website. Uh, from here, we would just click the explore our archival collections button. And this is gonna take you to the main page of archive space. So here there's a, a search box where you can essentially search for different formats or different topical areas. So for example, if you're interested in citrus, we go ahead and type in citrus, we limit the search to our collections and then hit search. So as you can see, we have two collections that are related to citrus. So we have one um, that contains citrus labels and another one on the National Orange Show here in San Bernardino. Um, if we were interested in, let's say, a format type, so photographs, for example, we could type in photographs. Again, we would limit to collections, search. And you can see we have 11 collections of either photographic collections. So for example, you know, the Charles Clayton Howe is, is entirely photographs as is steel. Um, but there are some other collections that just contain photographs. For example, the Latino Baseball History Project. It has artifacts memorabilia, but it also has photographs of Mexican-American baseball in Southern California. Uh, you can also browse through our collections if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. So up here in the collections tab, you would go ahead and click that. This lists all of the archival collections that have been processed and are available for use. Um, and so these are all of the finding aids listed. Uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at the first one. So this collection of California maps and guidebooks was actually used in the, in the first example I went over. Um, and this finding in here, just it has a very brief summary of what the collection contains, the dates that it covers. So it contains um, maps and guidebooks all the way back to 1889 up until 2009. It shows you how large the collection is. So the collection is about 20 boxes. And then it goes down here to just explain how the collection was arranged. So it was arranged by maps and guidebooks alphabetically. Um, if you look on the side here, we can actually click through and look at some individual items. So if we're interested in guidebooks, let's say from San Diego, we'd click cities and counties S to Z. And if you click it, this is an individual item. So San Diego, California, Greeter's Guide to the Traveler that was published back in 1921. Um, so if you're looking for individual items, that's how you're gonna find them here. Uh, another thing that you can do in archive space, um, you can actually you know, search collections by subject. So for example, let's say we were interested in all collections related to the Inland Empire. We go here to the subjects tab, we click Inland Empire, California. We have 12 collections that uh, have some type of relation to uh, in the Inland Empire, whether it was collected by someone from the Inland Empire or it, it documents things, uh, essentially the history of our area. Um, so that's if you're interested in a specific you know, topic or geographic area. Um, you can also look here for different formats. So for example, if you're interested in postcards, for example, you could click the postcards subject. We've got two collections. So one collection of postcards and then our collection on the Tournament of Roses also contains some postcards related to uh, that agency. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover today is just to show you how you can actually request materials directly through archive space. Um, so if you were to go into a collection, so if we go into the Tournament of Roses and let's say I wanna view a postcard, I would go and I could say, okay, I'm interested in this 1935 Souvenir Rose Tournament uh, of Pasadena. From here, let me just cry. You would, there's a request button. So you'd go ahead and click request. You'd fill in your information, submit the request. And then within about 24 to 48 hours on average, um, you can be using these materials in our reading room. You know, sometimes it may be a little bit longer uh, if you need it rushed and need to see things same day. Sometimes we can accommodate that as well. Um, but this would be the way to request uh, materials through special collections. Um, so with that, uh, my portion is done and I will turn it over to Brent. Go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so my portion is gonna be a little bit more nuts and bolts about library stuff in general. Um, so let me just read off something real quick because I don't want to mess it up. Um, the online portion of the Fowl Library has hundreds of thousands of ebooks, tens of thousands of periodicals, including scholarly journals, nearly 100,000 streaming videos, 
millions of pages of archival and primary source materials, as well as data sets for demographic, business, and scientific research, and much more. And all of these are located in about 300 discovery and content databases that we subscribe to. Um, we, I always want to stress that that's not all we have. We still have hundreds of thousands of books and bound periodicals for your students or yourselves to um, access. So uh, don't forget those things. And these things can put, be put on reserve. Textbooks or other reading list materials can be put on reserve. Um, and I'll talk about how you can contact the librarian to help you out with these kind of things in a moment. I want to piggyback on what Eric was showing. Um, of course, our archives are heavily focused on the local Inland Empire region or Southern California, uh, a little sli slightly broader. Um, but oftentimes there's courses that don't cover those materials and, you know, but somebody still might want to do some archival stuff or use primary resources. So I'm going to go ahead and click here on our choose a database um, link that gets you access to those 300 databases we were talking about. Um, they are broken down by discipline here. So just for example, we've acquired a lot of ethnic studies databases in the last year and a half. And if I click on that, you'll see the list. They're mostly primary resource. So you'll see here that they have things like historical newspapers, um, diaries, speech, uh, speeches, treaties, uh, maps, oral histories, all kinds of things that you can use the same assignment that Eric had set up there, but possibly for topics that are outside of the local access. So you can talk about, you know, write up a 300 word um, uh, description of the object you found and how you found it and what you think about it. So basically using the same structure that Eric was showing, but for a broader archival context. Um, in, in this course, case, I, I, I clicked on um, uh, ethnic studies and there's tons and tons of databases here, but we also have them under um, gender studies, sexuality studies, and other places as well, where there's some of these sort of primary um, historic archives that we've subscribed to. Okay. Um, another thing that's cool, let me back up one level here. Um, you can replicate the archival research process. I know Eric's um, samples, the sort of the, the items were sort of sort of handed to the students in a sense, because they're only there for an hour and they don't have really time to look up these things. But if a, if a, research, if a, a professor wants to really show the research process of how you would go to an archive and what it would look like, um, Eric, I'm sure could could handle that portion too. But also, if you were doing a topic that was outside of the local area, there are ways to replicate the archival uh, research process and through some of our databases. So, for example, if I click on gender and sexuality studies, we have this archives of sexuality and gender. It's a primary resource um, database, and then we also have the women's studies archive. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. This is um, given, uh, presented by a, a platform, a company called Gale, and a lot of their archives allow you to do something really cool. So when you're in the database and you click on collections, you can see what the content is. Now, these are archival collections taken from different institutions. Um, so these aren't like from, these are just all of, you know, Stanford's or, you know, Berkeley's or anything like that. These are going to be pulled from a lot of different areas. So for instance, the Alicia Escalante paper, she was a Chicana activist. Let's say we were interested in exploring something about her. We could click on this um, link. You can automatically search within that collection, you know, and look for things that, you know, of interest. But to actually show the archival process, we could drop down here a little bit um, and click on like a particular series. So let's say we we're interested in correspondence, letters that she wrote or that um, uh, she had received. Um, we can click on that series and you'll start to see right off the bat, you see this box and folder arrangement. That's a traditional archival arrangement. So this, the way this particular um, uh, paper, this, this paper set was scanned in exactly as they found them on the shelf in that archive. They went to box two, folder one, and started scanning. And we can see right off the bat, we can actually see the actual folder that these things resided in. Okay. And then if we go to the next page, you could see the first letter, in this case, from the White House. And if you go to the next slide, it's the back side of that letter because there's some information on there and they don't want you to lose anything. So it's just like you were sitting in the, in the archive looking at this stuff. Even the envelope that it was sent in, the back side of the envelope that it was sent in. So 
it's really a way you can replicate what it's like to be in a physical archive, going to a box, looking at a folder, and looking at every item as it was originally um, within the uh, physical archive, but you're just doing it digitally. So it's kind of a cool way to show students how to use archives, if that's important to you. <laughs> so I'm gonna jump back and go to um, another way. Now I'm just gonna talk generally about kinds of assignments, things you can think about doing. This is the tip of the iceberg, and these are just kind of ideas that I brainstormed. Um, we have a lot of historical newspapers so if I go under our newspapers, local and regional, you'll see that we have the digital um, uh, San Bernardino Sun back to the 19th century, the Los Angeles Sentinel, which is the black newspaper of Los Angeles going back to 1934, Los Angeles Times going back to the 19th century. So you can combine databases. So we also have a link. It's, if you go to the national newspapers link, you'll see one for the New York Times. You could pick a topic that would be likely covered in those three newspapers and have students compare how the coverage is done at a national level with a major ma mainstream newspaper, at a local level with for mainstream newspaper, and at that local level from an ethnic perspective. So for instance, if you were looking at, let's say, the aftermath of the Rodney King verdict on April 29th, 1992, well, you can have them look at April 30th, 1992, in the New York Times, LA Times, and LA Sentinel, and then have them do a comparison of how were these, how was the, the topic treated? You know, what was the level of empathy coming from a national level, a local level, and then from the actual community where a lot of these events were occurring? So, and this could be for history, it could be for calm studies, it could be for political science, you could be for expository writing. This is not limited to just history. So a lot of people think these historical newspaper databases are exclusive to one discipline, but they can be used in any number of ways if you're creative about it. And that's the point here is to sort of try to look at these databases from a different angle and how you might be able to make use of them. Um, and I will at the end show you how to get in contact with librarians through your particular department. So you can kind of discuss some of these ideas and, and, and brainstorm amongst yourself and that librarian to see if you can't find some databases that match up to some points you're trying to make in this class for your project that you're um, gonna assign. So let me go back again to the list of database subjects or subject databases. Mm -hmm. And now it's another way of thinking outside the box a little bit. We have some underutilized resources that, you know, if people knew about them, they would probably use. So for instance, let's say you wanted to do some, um, some mapping of demographic data. You might go to our statistical data uh, subject set and then go to social explore. It does exactly that. There's a ton and ton of different um, uh, data sets in here that you could map. So we can click here on explore. <clears throat> and let's say you had, you're asking your students to pick, you know, um, either your, um, your uh, ethnic background, uh, immigration um, history, or some interesting one that you like from a recent immigrant history um, and go ahead and let's map that data. So if I go here, I'm gonna change this to 2021 because it gives me more options. Sometimes older stuff, it gives you more options when you're mapping. <laughs> and then you go to, down to Asian and Hispanic groups. So let's say you had a student that said, well, you know, my, my parents immigrated from Guatemala. So that's the, the group I wanna work with. You can click on that and you can go here and go to Central America, select Guatemalan and then go to the map. Well, initially it, it maps at the state level, which isn't very interesting, right? So, we, but we can break this down into like zip code. And now I can see the, um, the Guatemalan population by zip code, people of Guatemalan heritage. Um, so you're seeing that there's a quite a bit of, of like, like you would expect over here, you know, near downtown LA, there's a big pocket where 25% nearly of the population um, is of Guat Guatemalan extraction. Um, right next door to that um, zip code, a little bit less, but still quite significant. You can come over to the Inland Empire and start kind of see how um, the breakdown is here. Um, and then you can also zoom out and start looking nationally. Where are there pockets of Guatemalan immigrants? Well, you can see by color, the darker the color, the more folks there are within that particular zip code. So in Nebraska, there's a particular zip code where 17% of the population is of Guatemalan descent. 
Now, of course, the numbers are much less, you know, total numbers. You know, you could find, you know, hundreds of thousands of people of Guatemalan descent in Southern California, but in Nebraska, it's, uh, you know, the total uh, population is going to be less, but there's a significant portion in particular zip codes. And you can see that by mapping this. Um, you go to the East Coast, there's a huge concentration of Guatemalan immigrant um, in, uh, immigrants in Delaware for one particular reason or another. Um, and you can see that some of these zip codes have up to, you know, a third of the population is of Guatemalan um, descent. So it's a very interesting way you can start to map certain things. And there's a lot of stuff in here. It's, it's um, you can pick, this goes back 200 years. So you can pick, uh, you know, a topic from 1810. And let's say we want to, to map, uh, you know, slavery in the 1810. It's going to give us, and we want to know the pop slave population in the, the enslaved population in, in 1810, and it can break that down like that too. So this is not just historical, it's not just you know um, contemporary demographic, you can use it for both of those types of things and much more. And this and it's not just ethnic stuff, there's poverty, there's gender stuff, there's um, health stuff related in these data sets. Um, so it's a really cool underused resource, so I, I hope folks would find a way to use it. Um, similarly, um, if I go over here to the business topic, so most people are, okay, it's business, I'm not interested. Um, but there are some hardcore business usage um, of these databases. So if I go under industry data from business and go to like IBIS World. So yeah, it's a marketing slash industry database. But if you were to have, a, you know, even an expository writing class or anything, um, you know, sociology class, and you said, tell your, you know, to have your students pick a, an industry that they've worked in or have, are currently working in or are interested in working in and you know find out some particular facts about it. So somebody who worked at Starbucks might click on this link. Somebody who's worked at McDonald's might click on this link. You can also search up here. These are just ones that are trending right now. Click on fast foods. And yes, it gives me a lot of business related data, data, but if you're interested in looking at these things at a finer level, you can start to see certain things like, okay, well, they make almost $400 billion a year in revenue only about a quarter of that is in wages. If you look at like a university, it's going to be like 80, 90% of wages are the total um, you know, usage of the, of the budget. Here, it's only a quarter. You can see the profit margin was 4.3% over the last five years, but wages only went up 2.1% or 2.7%. So you could start to say, oh, you know, there's some social implications here. And there's a lot of other categories of things you can look at here. Um, you know, they talk about, you know, oh, you know, barriers to entry, there's more regulate, there's more regulation of that particular industry. So there's just little things you can, you can pick out of here that aren't, they are business database, it's business statistics, but you can use them creatively in other kinds of disciplines. Okay. Um, back to the front page um, of the library. There are some um, databases we've used, um, we've created assignments around with particular departments or particular courses. So if I go here under library guides and then go drop down to psychology, we used to do about 20 sessions teaching for a Psych 311. Now it's Psych 3311. Uh, they changed the uh, numbering. And this was one we created because we were doing those 20 classes and we thought this one really is calling out for some other means of doing this kind of uh, teaching. And so what we've created is uh, in partnership with the psychology department is they, the students would watch these sort of information literacy, critical information literacy videos um, and, and figure out how to do APA citation by clicking on some of these um, um, links. Then they do a pre-lab assignment. So they kind of see where they're at. And then they can move over to the lab and they watch some more videos. Now these videos are specific to the course, how you would do the lab. And they're pretty extensive. This is one's 24 minutes, another one's 40 minutes. And it talks about how you go to Psych Info, do searches, look at articles, evaluate those article, articles, and then they would click on this lab report and fill out that form, which is basically dissecting an article, figuring out you know, what, what the citation is, what, what the parts of a citation are, what the abstract is saying this article is about, is it, is it going to be useful for your particular assignment, that kind of thing. So that was kind of a cool one we've created with the department. Um, we've also created them for particular uh, databases for particular departments like chemistry. So it's not all social science and humanities. We do stuff with the sciences as well. 
So for Kim 5800, we actually teach a course for them, uh, a, an instruction course that tells them how to use um, ACS, which is how you find American Chemical Society database, how you find stuff dealing with chemistry. But we've also set up this library guide that supports that so that they're able to refer back to it when they need it um, after they've watch the session and they're actually trying to complete the assignment, which also has some components where you're, you know, you're dissecting, you know, a, a record within ACS and trying to figure it out. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, you can do it a libguide only. You can do a libguide in conjunction with an instruction session, or we can create a whole lab type scenario where we um, offer that kind of thing to uh, a whole department or even just a series of courses. Okay. So those are the things I wanted to um, cover. Um, so I, one last thing, actually, I'm sorry. One last thing I wanted to show um, is this link for services for faculty. If you click on there, um, you'll see a link to the instruction um, request, which you can also request LibGuides. And this is uh, sort of William's area. And then also the Critical Information Literacy Lab that he was talking about. But also I wanted to show um, two things. One, when you put an item um, link to an item, this resource here tells you how to. So all those databases I showed you, if you wanted to link to a particular ebook, a particular database, or a particular chapter or article, this is the, the um, page that will tell you how to do that. And it gives you very important information about stable URLs, proxy server prefixes that you need to have in your link in order for it to work properly. Lastly, I want to show you where you can get help from a librarian liaison. So on this same uh, list of resources here, you can click on li librarian liaison and see who that librarian is for your department. And you can um, you know, get to know this person, you can email them, call them, set up a consult um, over here under library appointments, you can set up a 30 minute consult with them. And, and then you can brainstorm these kind of ideas. Oh, I had this assignment idea, what do you think as what databases might work for that or you know what kinds of resources does the library have okay that's what i wanted to show you all um are there any questions for any of us at this point let me unshare here all right so <clears throat> thank you brent i'll go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll go ahead and take questions yes i have a question for william